Hello Monsters, thanks for stopping by. Tonight we have three tantalizing and creepy stories to share with you. Stories about zombies, vampires, and stalkers. Now Monsters, let's give a big shout out to MargeBot for lending her awesome voice for tonight's stories. Thank you MargeBot, and Monsters, be sure to check out her channel, a link will be in the description below. She's got a lot of awesome and creepy content over there you don't want to miss. Alright Monsters, well we know what you came here for it and we are here to provide so without further ado let the stories begin this story is called passenger this takes place at night in lisa's kitchen lisa a 23 year old woman in sweatpants and a t-shirt is gripping a cup of coffee nervously while talking on the phone the person she is on the phone with is her boyfriend, Tyler. The phone is connected to an outlet and charging. On the counter in front of her is a bulging purse and a large paper bag filled with clothes, along with a small knife. The kitchen is large and on the other side of the room is a large window, covered in curtains. There is a rocking chair by the door, next to a dinner table. I saw him a couple times today at really peculiar places. It's spooking me out. Oh, yeah. Well, like where? Lisa unplugs the phone and starts walking around talking. On campus, just sitting in the field, he caught me looking and smiled at me. I wanted to puke. Lisa is now wandering into the door opposite of the rocking chair, which leads her to a garage. There are tools, equipment, and random junk lined up on the walls and on shelves. There is also a used but good shaped car in the middle. Tyler can be heard on the other line doing something else. Ah, uh, okay. Then at work, I could see him across the street, leaning on his car. I could feel his fucking eyes on me. Well, did you get your boss to tell him to fuck off? I asked, but since he was across the street, there was nothing she could do. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, if he does anything, call me. Tyler is about to hang up. Wait, wait! Yeah, what, what's up? I even saw him when I was walking home. I noticed his creepy car drive past me on my street. The sicko might know where I live. Lisa walks into the kitchen and goes to the front, back to the window, where her coffee is. The rocking chair by the door is now rocking back and forth, ever so slightly. Okay, so get a padlock on your door or something. Uh, what do you want from me, Lisa? The rocking chair stops rocking suddenly. Lisa still has her back turned to it. I want to spend the weekend at your place. <sighs> what? Are you sure? Yes, I'm already packed. Tyler sighs. Fine. What time is it now? Ten. Okay. Um, call me when you get here to wake me up. Tyler hangs up. Lisa grabs her purse, bag, and knife and walks into the garage and gets in her car. It's hard to notice, but things have been slightly moved from the last time Lisa walked in here. As if someone was snooping around. Lisa doesn't notice. A few hours later, still on the highway, Lisa is singing to Nirvana's song, Rape Me. Her phone is plugged into an ox and her bags are on the passenger side. A GPS suction to the windshield. And she's driving on the interstate with no other cars around. Mid-song, her car starts sputtering and slowing down. Lisa tenses up. Lisa pulls over to the side of the highway and parks her car. She keeps the key in the ignition and leaves the battery on for the lights. She gets out and walks to the hood and opens it. A little smoke comes out and Lisa coughs. There are car lights now and they're visible and very close. They slow down and pull over behind Lisa. Lisa is full on edge now, watching the car. A large man steps out of the driver's side door. It's a man by the name of Norman. Now Norman is a tall, lumbering, and overweight 35 year old. His hair is balding, and he has one of those checkered polo shirts on with slacks. Hi there. Well, looks like you've got a problem. The remarkable thing about Norman is there's nothing remarkable about him. Everything seems to be in order. 
Yet it just doesn't feel right. Lisa takes a while to respond. Yep. Wow, you need help or something? Norman takes a step towards Lisa. Lisa steps back towards the passenger side of the car. Norman stops. Well, you know, I can take a look at it, if you want. I've got, uh, tools in my truck. Lisa carefully walks over to the passenger side door. No, I'll be fine. Lisa opens the passenger door and reaches in for her purse. She grabs her knife and checks her phone. The battery life on her phone reads 8%. All the while, she is looking straight at Norman. Oh, it's no problem, really. Just a quick look won't hurt ya. Norman approaches the hood of the car, and Lisa steps back, revealing her knife to Norman. Norman sees the knife, then looks down at the engine and starts fidgeting with it. Do you always go around helping people in the night? Oh, yeah, only when I notice they uh, need help. Norman put a small but noticeable emphasis on need. After a very tense moment, he slams the hood. Ah, there you go. All done. Just a malfunctioning ignition switch. You won't have any more problems. Norman walks back to his car but doesn't go in. Lisa takes this time to open the passenger door and jump into the driver's seat and turns the car on, which works now. As she speeds off, she can see Norman standing and watching her drive off. A few hours later, Lisa enters Cleveland from the interstate. She arrives on Erie Street 30 minutes later. Lisa is now driving on a beat up road in a very shitty neighborhood. It is poorly lit and she is surrounded by a dead park on her left and a crumbling old church with boards on the windows and graffiti covering it on her right. A defective apartment complex is after the church. The GPS reads, approaching destination in 500 feet. Lisa's car starts sputtering again and slows down. No smoke can be seen protruding from under the hood. Lisa is forced to park. Oh, fuck. Lisa looks around, and then slowly gets out of the car and makes her way to the hood, which is smoking. As she opens it, the smoke blows into her face. After clearing the smoke, she inspects the engine only to find a small gadget attached to it with a blinking light. She removes it and after scanning it with her eyes widen, she immediately breaks the device, throwing it into the park. She quickly gets back into her car and tries to turn the engine on, but it won't run. Lights can be seen in the distance from the rear view mirror. A car is turning onto the street. Lisa tries to get the car running, but it won't turn on. Lisa looks at the GPS, then grabs her purse and bags, and starts walking to the apartment complex. The car is starting to speed up, but it's still a good 100 yards behind. Lisa starts to walk faster, but the car is gaining on her. Now as Lisa is approaching the apartment, the car is close enough for Lisa to recognize it as the car from the highway. Lisa beelines for the door, rushing through it as Norman's car approaches the apartment. Now, inside the apartment complex lobby. The lobby of the complex is large, and across from the door and half-broken glass paneling is an elevator. And to the left of the elevator are stairs. Lisa first scrambles to the elevator, only to see that it's on the eighth floor. Now, across from Lisa, Norman is seen getting out of the passenger door. Lisa dashes to the stairwell as Norman is entering the building. Followed by a second man wearing baggy, beat-up clothes, with a hat and hoodie masking his face. Now in the apartment stairwell. As Lisa runs up the stairs, two pairs of footsteps can be heard rushing to the stairs. Norman and the stranger burst through the stairs and start running up, but Lisa is already three stories ahead. The chase continues, with Norman catching up with Lisa, with the stranger lagging behind. When Lisa reaches the seventh floor, she bursts out of the stairwell. Now on the seventh floor. The seventh floor reveals a short hallway that turns left onto a much longer hallway with the apartments. As Lisa turns the corner and sprints down the corridor, 
Norman is just getting out of the stairwell. Tyler! Tyler! Open the fucking door! Halfway down the hallway, Lisa stops at the door on the right labeled 732. Lisa pounds on the door and looks back to see Norman turning the corner, out of breath. And Tyler can be heard from inside, slowly getting up and walking to the door, at the same time as Norman is approaching Lisa. As Tyler reaches the door, Norman is three feet away from Lisa, reaching his arms out. Lisa is screaming her head off. Just as Tyler opens the door, Norman grabs Lisa, and Lisa stabs him with her knife. And Tyler is taken a while to register what the hell is going on. Norman lets go of Lisa and falls back, and Lisa falls back onto Tyler. Lisa appears utterly disturbed with what she had just did as she looks at Norman in agony on the ground with blood gushing from the stab wound. And Tyler drags her into the apartment and slams the door. The other guy, the stranger, can be seen looking at Norman and the apartment door from around the corner. This story for the lust of blood is called Blood Lovers. In partial darkness, we see Rhonda on top of Jim on a sofa. Rhonda is all over him, kissing him, grabbing at him. He seems cautious and careful in his approach to her. She moves in excitedly, and he suddenly pushes her back. Hey, ow! Get off! Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. He pushes her off of him. I told you I can't do that anymore. Jim walks away, and Rhonda tries to get herself under control. Apartment, night two. Jim opens the door, and Rhonda is there looking cold and hungry, as if she hasn't eaten in several days. She's in a sexy outfit but shivers and clings to her small coat. Her thick makeup runs down her face like she has been crying. She starts in the door but he stands in her way. She falls against him. He whispers. I can't do this anymore. I can't. She grabs him and he struggles to get her free. She's very strong but weak from being hungry. He finally gets her out the door and shuts it. Apartment, night two. She screams and pounds on the door. Apartment, night two. Jim jams a chair under the doorknob and rests his back against the door as Rhonda pounds on it. He slips down to the floor and rests his face in his hands. Street corner, night three. Rhonda stands on a street corner in a sexy outfit. She looks very sick and weak. A car slows down and it's a group of teenagers. They roll down their windows and Rhonda gets a hungry look in her eyes and approaches. They throw handfuls of pennies at her and drive off laughing. Rhonda picks up a chunk of road from a pothole and chucks it at the car. The window shatters. A hand grabs her arm before she can pick up another chunk of road. It's Jim. She falls into his arms weakly. He sits her on the curb and holds her. She is crying. Okay, okay. You can come home. Rhonda sobs and shakes her head yes. Apartment, night four. Rhonda is looking a little better. She's cleaned up in a bathrobe. Jim gives her a weak smile when he sees her. He starts to get off the couch, but she is suddenly by him and pushes him down. Again. Jim sighs and reluctantly nods. She gets on top of him and pins down his arms. She hits him across the face and his nose begins to bleed. She begins licking up the blood coming from his nose and her eyes flash with delight. This story is called, Stay Safe. It's morning time. This takes place in a basement. Alice, a young woman in her early 20s, is sleeping on her mattress. And she is pretty but pale and thin. And she opens her eyes and sleepily turns to look at her boyfriend, Victor, lying next to her. Victor is a few years older than Alice, and he is rough and messy looking but still handsome. Alice turns to look up at the ceiling. 
The basement is introduced, a dimly lit room decorated with a mattress, a desk, and two chairs. There is a pile of books in the corner, and a few boxes in the other. A bunch of pictures and postcards are taped on the walls. The only window in the room is boarded up. Later, Alice and Victor are sitting at the desk eating breakfast in silence. Their cutlery is clanking against their plates. After a few moments of silence, Victor speaks without looking up from his meal. I'm going out today. We're running low on food. Uh-huh. The two go quiet again for a few seconds as they continue eating. Anything specific you want? Whatever you can find, it's not like you ever bring anything I ask for. Victor gets up from the table leaving his unfinished breakfast. He walks away as Alice still eats. Are you going to clear that? Victor comes back into frame and grabs his plate. He takes it away. Victor is now in the bathroom. The bathroom is small and messy. Alice is washing her plate in the sink. Victor calls for her from the room next door. I'm gonna go now. Alice puts down the plate and leaves the bathroom. In the basement, Victor is putting his shoes on getting ready to leave. He is carrying an empty bag. Alice walks into the room and goes to kiss him. Be careful, okay? Alice, I, I am always... Victor brushes Alice's hair behind her ear. He then walks out of the basement. Alice stands and looks after him for a moment before turning her attention to the room she is in. She looks around wondering what to do. Later, Alice is cleaning the basement. She has tied her hair up in a ponytail and she is mopping the floor. She then wipes the desk clean, rearranging the chairs and tidies up the book pile. She then goes on to change the sheets on the mattress. When she is all done, she stops and looks around the room. She wipes sweat off her forehead and lets out a sigh. Alice is now lying on the mattress reading a book. She does not concentrate on the book for very long and turns to look around the room, examining the walls with her eyes. She notices a tiny gap on the boards blocking the window, which is letting in a single ray of sunshine. She gets up and goes to the window. She tries to look through the gap, but it is too small. She touches it with her fingers, and closely examining it. She then crumples up a piece of paper and sticks it into the gap to block it. She takes a few steps back to look at her work before returning to the mattress. Later, Alice is still on the mattress with her book when the door opens. Victor walks in with a bag on his shoulder, and Alice sits up. Alice, hey. Hey, how did it go? Uh, same old, same old. Uh, how about you? Same old. Victor puts down his bags and lays down on the mattress. He lets out a heavy, tired sigh. Alice runs her hand on his chest affectionately before standing up. She starts unpacking Victor's bag and taking out food items and supplies. Did you see a lot of them? Uh, yeah, no, it was pretty quiet today. That's good. Maybe they're leaving the area. Look, I know what you're gonna say. The answer is still no. Alice stops unpacking and gives Victor an annoyed look. One day something's gonna happen and I can't help you from here. Oh, look, I told you. When it's safer out there, you can come with me. You better promise. Victor sits up and grabs Alice's arm. He pulls her down onto the mattress next to him and wraps his arms around her. Look, Alice, I promise. Alice smiles and gives Victor a quick kiss. She then gets up and continues unpacking. Later on, Alice is still sitting at a desk writing in a journal. Behind her, Victor lays on a mattress reading an old magazine. Alice closes her journal and leans back on her chair. I finished another one. Oh, no way. Already? Well, I just got that one for you. There's not much else to do down here now. Alice throws the journal on top of the pile of books. Look, hey, I'll find you a new one tomorrow. And maybe some new books, too. Alice stands up and goes to Victor. 
And she lays down on the mattress next to him and sighs. And Victor lays down too, facing her. Alice, oh, what is it? Alice thinks for a moment. I don't know how much longer I can stay down here. Victor rolls over onto his back and stares at the ceiling. He doesn't say anything. It's been two years. I miss the outside. Look, I've told you before. When it's time, I'll let you know and we'll get out of here. We'll find other survivors, but it's not safe out there yet. Not for you. You're special. Victor turns over to Alice again and pulls her sleeve up, exposing a healed scar on her arm. He runs his finger across it. You got bent, and all it gave you was amnesia. You didn't turn into one of those things. If I'm the cure like you say I am, we could have saved so many lives in these two years. Look, I just couldn't get you out of here safely. But I can soon. Wait, I have something for you. Victor stands up and walks to a jacket that's unfolded on the back of a chair. He pulls something out of the pocket. He walks back to the mattress and sits down. He hands Alice a small key. Are your eyes closed? Okay, open them. Here, it's a key to the basement door. Alice squeezes the key in her hand, but Victor suddenly grabs her hand with his. Hey, Alice, look. This is for emergencies only. I hope you never have to use it without me, but you should have it, just in case. Thank you. A little later on, Alice is standing in the basement looking at a small Polaroid picture taped to the wall. It is an overexposed photo of a sandy beach. She touches it and traces its shape with her fingers. She closes her eyes as she can almost hear the sounds of the beach in her ears, feel the sun on her skin and the wind in her hair. She enjoys this moment fully until the door flings open and she is ripped back to reality in the dark basement. Victor walks in the room, grasping his arm, which he has wrapped in a jacket. Alice turns to look at him. Are you okay? Victor unwraps his arm and reveals a bleeding cut on it. He groans in pain. Alice gasps and runs to him. What happened? Did you get bit? Ah, fuck. No. One of them scratched me. It's okay. Alice backs away a few steps staring at Victor. They can turn you by just scratching you. Victor gives Alice an annoyed look. <sighs> Fuck. No, they can't. I'm fine. You said it. You said you've seen it happen. I never said that. What do you know anyway? <sighs> Fuck. You've never even seen them. Victor takes on a first aid kit and sits on the mattress. He starts cleaning his wound. Alice does not move. Victor! Alice, stop panicking. I've never seen anyone turn from a scratch. There's always a bite. Are you sure? Fuck, uh, yes! Alice, are, are you gonna help me or not? Alice walks to Victor and sits next to him. And she starts wrapping his arm in a bandage. Victor notices she is still a bit uneasy. Please, calm down, Alice. Nothing's gonna happen to me. I promise. I never said that. Maybe I remember wrong. Yes, you do. It is nighttime now. Victor and Alice are laying on the mattress. Victor is sleeping, but Alice stares at the ceiling, fully awake. She turns to look at Victor and his bandaged arm. And she frowns and looks back at the ceiling. She then gets up and quietly walks to the pile of books. She looks through the covers until she finds the one she needs. She then sits at the desk with the book and opens it. She starts searching through the pages, looking for a specific journal entry. She finally comes across a page that reads May 17th at the top. She reads through the entry and when she finds the sentence she is looking for, she quietly reads it, tracing the page with her finger. Victor told me he found a trapped survivor but couldn't save him. The survivor got scratched by a zombie and turned. Who would have thought that could happen just from a scratch? Alice gulps and leans back on her chair, afraid to move. She turns around to look at Victor, who was still sleeping heavily. She then turns to look back in front of her again. It is now morning. Alice is still sitting in the chair. 
She is having trouble keeping her eyes open as she has not slept all night. Victor is waking up behind her. <sighs> Alice? Alice is startled by Victor's voice and hesitantly turns to look at him, and she forces a smile on her face. Morning. <sighs> Could you not sleep? Oh, I just woke up. Victor sits up and rubs his eyes. He fills his arm with his left hand. My arm feels a lot better now. See, I told you there's nothing to worry about. Alice keeps her forced smile as Victor gets out of bed. But, well, should we have breakfast? I'll go get you that new journal today. Later on that day, Alice sits in the basement by herself. She is looking at the pictures on the wall and nervously rubbing her hands together. She starts rocking back and forth as she gets increasingly uneasy. She suddenly stands up and starts pacing back and forth in the room. She finally stops at the Polaroid picture of the beach and looks at it. She pulls it off the wall and holds it in her hand. She then looks up and breathes heavily. Alice turns around and goes to one of the boxes sitting in the corner. She opens it and starts rummaging through it. She pulls out a pair of trousers and a jacket, then gets a pair of shoes from a different box. She is moving quickly as she puts on her clothes. Alice sits on the mattress to put her shoes on, but hesitates. She looks around the room once again and her eyes stop on the pile of books in the corner. She gets up and goes to grab the newest journal. She turns to the last page and quickly writes something on it. She then goes back to the mattress and puts her shoes on. When Alice is dressed, she grabs one of Victor's bags and packs food and supplies in it. She then gets the baseball bat from the corner and examines it with her hands. She moves it around to get a comfortable grip on it. She then walks to the door. She pulls out the key Victor gave her and tries to put it in the lock, only to find out that it doesn't fit. She looks puzzled and tries again, but it still doesn't work. She looks at the key and throws it on the floor, frustrated. She raises her baseball bat and takes a deep breath. She quickly breaks the lock off with the bat. She turns to look around the basement one more time and then hesitantly pushes the door open. She steps out of the room. The journal she left open on the desk has the words, I'm sorry, scribbled onto it. Alice finds herself in a strange house. All the curtains are drawn. Alice breathes heavily as she stands still a moment, looking at her surroundings. The house is messy, but looks lived in. Alice walks through the living room, looking around. She spots a book on the table called How to Survive a Zombie Apocalypse. She looks at it and frowns, but keeps going. She walks into the next room and sees the front door. She looks back at the basement door, still hesitating. She decides that she has to be brave. Alice makes her way to the front door and tries the handle. The door is not locked and the handle moves down easily. Alice stops, visibly shaking and grasping the door handle. She lets go of it and takes a step back. She then turns around and sits on the floor, leaning back against the door and drops the baseball bat on the floor next to her. She's looking at her hands, holding back tears. She then pulls out the picture of the beach and looks at it. With a new wave of determination hitting her, she suddenly stands up and grabs the bat. She turns around again and flings the door open. Alice takes a step out of the house and gets blinded by sunlight as she has not been out of the basement in years. Alice cannot see and begins to panic. She still takes another step onto the street as she is determined to get out of there. Her eyes start to slowly adjust to the sunlight. She rapidly blinks as she tries to recognize her surroundings. She starts to see figures of people walking slowly along the street towards her and know they must be zombies. She raises her bat with both hands, nervously, ready to fight for her life. She is visibly scared as she tries to see more clearly. Her eyes are gradually adjusting to the light and something dawns on her. The figures look like normal people. 
Now the better her eyesight gets, the less they look like zombies. And suddenly, she hears a dog bark. Then a car drives past, and she realizes the figures around her are people. And she starts to understand that there never was any zombie apocalypse and her family is still alive. And she looks confused and slowly lowers her weapon. She starts to calm down a bit, but the realization is hitting her hard. As she is about to drop her back, Victor is seen slowly walking towards her from inside the house. Alice has her back turned to him and does not notice him. When Victor is close enough, he suddenly grabs Alice with both hands, covering her mouth so that she cannot scream. He pulls her back into the house and slams the door shut behind him. A shot of an old, tattered, missing persons poster taped to a nearby streetlight can be seen, featuring Alice.